Okay, so first of all, oh, and of course, would you, I'm, I'm unprepared here. Let's see. Okay, first of all, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Mike Connors holds a Master of Music degree in classical guitar. He founded and directed the guitar and Celtic harp programs at Penn Griffin School for the Arts, a 6th through 12th grade public school arts magnet in High Point, North Carolina. He and his students have won prizes in numerous competitions. He is an active harper, performer, multi-instrumentalist of Irish and Scottish music, and a featured clinician and adjudicator at festivals and workshops. Robin Gordon Cartier is a teacher in the East Orange School District, where she directs the harp program that she originally created for the Elizabeth School District. She is president of the North Jersey chapter of the American Harp Society and has served on the national level as second vice president, director at large, uh, and, and she continues to be a sought after presenter of workshops across the country. And her website is robingordoncartier.com. There's two Bs in her first name. Kim Perkins holds a master's degree in elementary education and teaches in schools while also teaching piano and Celtic harp privately to students from ages four to adult. She is the event organizer for the Scottish Performing Arts Classic and would love to see Celtic harp brought into schools as a regular part of music programs rather than as an eclectic or eccentric instrument. And Kim is the reason uh, why this meeting is taking place. She had contacted me about my experience teaching in public schools. Um, I'm a product of the Milwaukee Public School Heart Program from many, many, many years ago. And um, it was run by my teacher back then, Jean Henderson. So um, I am... I won't go into that right now. Kim, I think I'll just turn it over to you. If you want to start asking your questions, that would be great. And once again, welcome to everybody. I'm trying to speak and admit people at the same time. So pardon me if I look like a little bit la la land. I'm just admitting people. So, okay. So Kim, go ahead and start your questions, please. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so yes, I'm Kim Perkins and I perform and play at weddings and uh, restaurants, hotels, and teach, but I started wanting to teach in, because I, I teach in the school system, but I don't teach harp. So I, I am a substitute now, and I am a reading teacher, and I do all kinds of things, but, um, and teach privately. So I, I approached a, a public school in our Charleston, we're in Charleston, South Carolina school district and talked to them about this and realized this is like hitting a brick wall. You know, this is a new instrument. This is a, oh my gosh, what's this? I have to show them pictures and I have to sh bring in my harp. And they say, and so I, I did get some positive feedback, but it was just so um, like, well, we can't do this. We just can't do this. And so then I reached out to, um, Mary and I said, well, I, this is before I did my presentation to them and asked, you know, what music program, what method books am I going to show them that I would use? And Mary gave me some ideas. And then I reached out to Mike Connors, who's here because he has been successful at this. And so I asked him because he knows about how to do it. I've gotten some wonderful ideas and I've gotten some positive directions by what we've talked about in terms of moving forward in a private environment. Rather, I'm still going to work on the public school, but at least in private schools, they are more open to it. So um, this is what I want to ask Mike, which I think would help anybody trying to do this, is how did you get approval in the public systems for your HARP class? Um, and for you also, because um, Robin, you're doing the same thing, right? You're in a public system. Yeah. And I'd be also be interested in how Robin got started. But yeah, there aren't many uh, places that I know of where you're going to see a public school, uh, you know, want ad for a harp teacher. And if you're looking for one and you find one, uh, <laughs> good luck. Um, you know, I, I know they do a couple programs in, or I think Richmond, Virginia has them in public schools, um, but you, so, you gotta start somewhere. Um, I managed, I, I already, I was already a music teacher in the school. And so that when uh, I've done a few of these, uh, um, you know, seminars, question and answer sessions about starting uh, programs. 
And so, you know, a foot in the door is key. I mean, if, if no one knows who you are or what you do, it's going to be really hard to get anything started. Um, there are also after school programs. Um, so it helps to have a relationship with somebody at the school or the school district. I was hired as a uh, guitar teacher. I taught guitar and piano. And then um, I had a midlife crisis about 2006 and got my first harp. And <laughs> so I was a little, little sneaky about it because I was teaching these beginning uh, guitar classes and they were uh, you know, learning out of the chord approach book and learning all their little uh, when the saints go marching in and songs and you know, two-handed stuff. So I just brought my harp since I already knew how to do all that on piano and I would accompany them uh, on the piano, just play, uh, you know, with, on their pianos, playing the same thing on the harp. So I was literally getting paid to learn how to play the harp. And, um, and then the, the guitar classes, um, if you're leading a, a bunch of Suzuki kids doing uh, uh, twinkle variations and you've got a guitar, you're just the 21st guitar, they're really not gonna hear much. Um, and I noticed that when I played the harp, it had a different resonance, it cut through a little bit more, and they really liked playing along with the harp. Um, and then, uh, uh, then they started asking me to, to teach them how to play harp. And that's when you know, we started uh, you know, getting the ball rolling. So uh, to, to try to keep it short and, and maybe thinking of some things that might be useful uh, to some of the folks that are here, um, I would, uh, uh, on my free period, I'd go, I'd go around, I'd ask teachers if they wanted to hear harp music. I'd go play for all the classes. I'd go play for the principal. And at any school, um, the treasurer is your friend. And if you've ever, uh, if you've ever uh, taught at a public school, you want to be friends with the treasurer because they write the checks. They may not be able to decide um, how to spend the money, but they're, they're really good to have on your side. So I go to the treasurer's office, I find out when it's people's birthday and go play harp for them on their birthday. Um, and getting harps, and that was the tricky part. So we, we just decided to start a club after school. And I really thought it was a long shot to actually have a curriculum for harp. Um, but I had some of my guitar kids really wanted to learn to play. And of course, you know, I'm at a Title I school. They don't have money for harps. The school district is, is on, a, on a shoestring budget. Um, so I would, uh, I started, well, I went to Somerset and I hung around the Somerset Folk Harp Festival in New Jersey. And I hung around the vendors fair and made friends with some of the uh, builders and vendors. And I noticed that um, when they're cleaning up to go home, is a really good time to get a good deal on a harp uh, because they're going to have to box it up and ship it back to wherever. So I, I got a second harp um, there. And then at one point when I was driving home from Chicago, I knew I, I was going through Indiana. So I decided to visit Reese Harps and uh, where they make the harpsicles. And just uh, uh, when I got there, they were loading up and boxing up all their harps to, to ship uh, to a festival they were going to. So they... Um, um, so they said, well, we have one sitting right here. You know, you can have it for half price. So I ended up getting two or three extra harps myself and bringing those to school. And those were the harps the kids would play at, in the harp club after school. Um, and then we had a, um, decided to do a concert for a fundraiser and try to buy more harps. And, um, and people were really generous. You know, we reached out to all the media outlets and arts uh, um, organizations and NPR the local NPR station and, um, you know, of course the newspapers and, you know, this big concert and, you know, help children get harps is a great headline. You know, who, who doesn't want kids to have harps? Um, so we ended up with a handful of harps and once the kids could play a few things, um, that's when we started going out and visiting other schools and playing for civic organizations and, and, uh, and charities and, uh, you know, um, hospice and just getting out and playing and making sure people knew who we were. And, um, and then another friend that you want to have at the school is the guidance counselor, because she was the one that helped me write up the curriculum and get, and I got told no a lot. You know, if you get the, for, uh, for nine, nine people that say no, that one that says yes, count cancels out the rest. So um, when, when, you, when I realized I had a couple of allies that really wanted to do this and they asked me to uh, write a curriculum, they had to submit it to the county for them to, uh, you know, to approve so they could get course credit for it. And we um, decided to have the class as a zero block class before school. So I came, went in an hour early every day 
Um, and I, I would only do it if the kids would commit to doing it every day. I did not want it to be something that they come once in a while. And so when it was a club, we did it every single day. And, um, and then once it became approved for a class, yeah, it would meet an hour before school every day. And, 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 you know, another suggestion for getting harps is if you have, if you're at a school that has, a, you know, any kind of a shop or technology class, we managed to scare up, <clears throat> scare up a little bit of money to um, get a couple of the music makers kit harps and the kids assembled the harps. And they had a blast because kids, parents, other teachers, I would get the art teacher in there and get people who liked woodworking. And, and, and there were lots of photos, great photo ops of kids with tools building harps. And so word gets out and people really are generous. Uh, um, community Foundation, we started writing grants that helped us get the harps. Um, so that's kind of how we got started. Um, kind of all over the place here, but. No, that's, that's great, thanks. And Robin, what's your story? Well, you know, I think um, just like he said, you know, that that all over the place really fits in in there. And I think when Mike said your foot in the door, my degree, my um, bachelor's degree, and I went to college as an older person. I got my first degree at 32 and all during those classes. So you imagine you're an older person, you're going to school, you're working full time, you are a different kind of student. And I always said with this music education classes, I'd be like, every time I had a ta ta ti ti or gung gung with the orf instruments and Kodai and all those different classes, I always kept saying, one day, all I'm gonna teach is harp. That's it, you watch and see. And I would say that and they would laugh at me. And so my degree was a vocal general teacher and I got my first job teaching K to eight vocal general. I can play the piano. I know how to play the piano, I can play it, but I'm almost like, you know, the really old piano teachers that are like, um cha, um cha, that's the kind of piano I play. And because I taught choir, I didn't wanna be bothered with the piano. So I took my harp to school. My harp's at school, the kids see it just like Mike said, they wanna play it. I didn't want them playing my harp. So I took other harps to school. I'm like, I don't want y'all playing this one. Let me take some other harps to school. And all of a sudden I had all these children who wanted to learn how to play. And so for my very first concert as a choral director teacher at my first school, I had in Marinda who's here, you know, I probably borrowed one of her harps. All of a sudden I borrowed harps. I had 10 kids playing the harp plus the choir plus everything else. I had all the borrowed harps and the supervisor asked my husband, it's like, wow, this is great. Where'd we get all these harps from? And he's like, no, I'm taking them home tonight. But those are the harps. And that's kind of how the harp program began in my first job. But it was still, um, you have to be careful. You know, I'm a teacher. You need to be certified to work in a public school, point blank, period. So Mike said with the private schools that that's an option. Also, if you're not certified for teaching in schools, I would say your best, next best chance of starting a group heart program would be to go to the churches. Oh my gosh, there's nothing more adorable than having those little kids come learn to play the harp like David did in the Bible. And you got that whole kind of thing because it will grow. It will grow. If you start it, yes, you might have to use your own materials. In Elizabeth, where I taught K to eight, I was there for two years and they moved me to the high school, which was the performing arts school. I didn't want to move. But that was the price because he's like, nope, we're moving you to high school and you're going to teach harps, piano and choir. So that happened there. I didn't want to be teaching all that. Y'all remember what I said. So ultimately when East Orange, um, where I live, came asking me about why am I teaching in Elizabeth? If I live in East Orange. And we had at that point like magnet schools. Um, I was able to say, well, no, I only want to teach harp. No, I won't come if I have to teach choir. Like I was able to just say all I wanted to do is harp. And that's what I do five days of the week one period a day, two for my eighth, uh, my 11th and 12th graders every day. And that's all I teach. And ultimately, you know, like in Elizabeth, they ultimately bought some harps and you do, you have to start small. Even if you music maker them, um, Dennis Waring, if you do the builder harps, wood and strings is really where you have to get your mindset. If it's wood and it's strings and you get them to play something cute, the funding will come in. At the school I moved to, I am a program. So they purchased the harps. I did not move to that school until we had a big purchase order for a lot of harps. And then of course, every year it's a fight, 
but it's a fight you can win because you kind of have proof of success. I also am very attracted to the um, kids that nobody else wants. And that's a real good target kind of way and audience, you know, and I guess because I was like, you know, the kids who are kind of like, you know, not interested, they're pains, they're just roughnecks, they're just the rough kid, put a harp in the rough kid's hand, you're going to get some funding because all of a sudden it's, it's attractive. And um, that's, that's where we do now. That's all I teach is harp five days a week six classes a day. I have 42 students this year. I only take 10 a grade, um, but yeah. I love what you said about the rough kids because you know there were a couple of kids and you could tell that, uh, uh, that they were a little different than some of the other kids. And people would come to our concert and they'd always ask about that one kid, you know, and, and you know, there's a kid that um, had, uh, was on the spectrum, but he was a brilliant heart player and they could tell that, that, you know, he had some special needs. They'd always ask about him. The head of the community foundation would tell everyone, hey, these kids that wouldn't, there's no way they would ever get a chance to have their hands on a harp. And they're learning to play the harp. You got to see this. And then you get other people to do the bidding for you. And we even had, um, they said that they were going to, uh, they wanted to interview me and ask about our program. And what I hadn't realized was that when we played at the um, we played at the country club for some function, and the lady who's one of my allies, um, when I wasn't there, she told everyone to get their checkbooks out, and she got fourteen patrons to write a check for a thousand dollars each, and they bought us our first pedal harp. And it was just it was my they, they surprised me, you know they uh, uh, I didn't know that's what they were doing. They took me out in the hall and asked me a couple questions and told the kids before they told me. And then they made a big deal of photo op with a check for fourteen thousand dollars. I was like, "Hey, kids, ever hold a check for fourteen thousand dollars?" Absolutely. <laughs> and one of the one of the kids said, "You know, we could buy six or seven uh, lever harps with this. You know, but we uh, we you know that they wanted us to get a pedal harp, so that's you know we got it. And so when Nutcracker time comes around, people are really delighted." Um, <laughs> Well, yes. this brings up, I have a question for um, both of you who have done this, because the district asked me this in my presentation, do the, they wanted the kids to be able to take them home to practice them. So if the district buys the harps, do the kids get a harp to take home or can the kids buy a harp of their own if their parents, you know, can, can do so. And so there's a mixture. So like getting the harps and like, what if a kid wants to take one home for the weekend and practice? Is this something that's allowed? You want to go first, Robin? Sure, sure. So my students come every day. They, we're working on that. It is something really important to me also um, to have that feeder program, to have the kids who can take home harp homes, harps home to practice. But when it became really a thing is COVID. All of a sudden, I'm a harp teacher who teaches harp and we are totally remote. So we purchased um, 20 harpsicles. And now, interestingly enough, and I, I, I do, you know, I love the harp. I love wood and strings. Let's be clear. So wood and strings, I think you can do anything with anything, right? And I do, I, I love the harpsicles. I think they're good harps. I think they're built well. I do not think, I think we know like with everything, you wouldn't say that a, uh, um, I don't know a low, so I'd say, I'll just say a, a hoopty, you know, the car that's barely running compared to a BMW, compared to a Mercedes. So we do understand there are levels of harps. So when I got the harpsicles, I didn't want them to be that good. I.e., I just got plain harpsicles with no levers because I didn't want them to replace the fact that in my classroom, we have troubadours, we have um, um, uh, Ogdens, we have the lever harps that, you know, you could really play as a professional and we have pedal harps. So I didn't want anyone to get the idea that the whole room could be harpsicles. They're great, but for what I need and what I wanted my kids to have. So now my kids have harpsicles that they can take home. I will say, you just have to really work hard with the kids because you can get kids taking harps home and guess what they're coming to class every day they're not practicing 
one out of maybe 20 kids are going to practice. They just really aren't. And so it's a double edge. It's I send harps home with kids I can make a real show of who are going to practice, but yet I still have to work extra because they're not just going to do it on their own. So they have <laughs> goals they have to meet. So we do have the harpsicles and ultimately I'm hoping to get all my um, folk harps out and at home because my kids are big. So I need big harps. I need preludes. I need troubadours. My kids are big, tall kids. So whereas adults can play smaller folk harps because we know what we're doing, it's a different thing teaching position and teaching things with the kids slumped over. So that's my that's my take on it. And I don't let the parents buy any. I tell them to save up for a harp that they're going to go to college with. Yeah, I, it's similar experience. It, it took a while. Um, we got a bunch of harpsicles. I think we've got, well, we've got, they're sitting there now. You know, I retired from the uh, public school gig. Um, but they're, um, I think when I left, we had maybe 14 of them. And we had about half a dozen Dusties. And we had, you know, a few other, uh, a few other harps there. So uh, going back to the question of taking them home, we met every day. And um, so they got to play every day. And, and like Robin said, you could send harps home with kids and, and you know, not very many of them are necessarily gonna practice on them. So um, what I would do is, I mean, you can tell who's really working and who's really into it. And if there is, and some of these kids started playing some gigs and stuff. So, it, it, but it's a very difficult balance because well, you let them take a harp home and how come I can't take one home? So I had to be very careful about sending harps home because we didn't have enough for everyone in the class to have one at home and then also have our, our set at school. Um, what I did do though, is I have a neighbor who's a woodworker and he helped us build these stands for, um, for the harpsicles. And it has a little, little butterfly nut on it and you can, um, you can screw it on so it stands up and so they don't have to try to do the balancing act. You know, they, um, and if they actually fit in the case, I know they, um, from Reese Harps, they also, you can have a snare drum stand, the metal folding stand that has a little thing on it that's designed to fit the harp. So they, they were fairly functional at home, but I did, I agree, I, I, I wanted them to, that's a practice harp. That's so you could have your fingers on some strings if that's what you really wanna do. But the luxury of getting to see the kids every single day. And um, now I would have all four high school grades in the same class at the same time. And it got so popular that they actually added it as an elective. So they auditioned for our school in their arts area. So they were a major in guitar. They were a major in orchestra or dance or theater. Um, and because of the four by four block scheduling, only four classes a day. So they didn't get a lot of elective choices. Um, but there was at one point they decided to go ahead and, and do one of the blocks. And it was great because it was the block that had lunch in it. So these kids, mostly seniors, had like a two-hour harp class every single day. So even though they weren't uh, practicing at home, they had plenty of chance to practice and to play. And we would we do we would work as a harp circle, but then also sometimes I would work with some kids. And now you go practice, I'll come check on you in the half hour. And and you know, so they it wasn't all of us all playing together all of the time. And then you also get the older students helping teach the younger students. So, you know, it's, it's that differentiation. So all those harps are being played and around. Um, and then, but it did, after a while, people were, um, I spent a lot of time coaching people on how to find a harp and how to get a harp. Um, they were looking on Craigslist. You know, there's the, uh, um, you know, the parents that bought a, a Dusty Ravenna 34 string harp for their daughter who played it for a while and really wasn't interested. She went off to college and they're moving and that harp is just sitting there and they want someone to play it. And they list it on Craigslist and they might list a $3,000 harp for $1,000. And, um, you know, so I would kind of help them, you know, make sure it's not cracked. Some kids would have to drive, you know, the family would have to drive a couple hours to get it. But more and more kids started finding harps. I just had to find a very uh, um, creative way to encourage them not to buy any harps that were made in Pakistan. Um, and if you play harp, you know what I'm talking about because those, those are some really, really junky harps out there. And people think they're being generous by donating these, these clunkers that fall apart and the levers don't engage and they're 
tension is awful and they're really unplayable. I think we had two or three of them basically as decorations in the room. They look pretty, um, but if someone goes to, uh, uh, to buy a, a Celtic harp online and Googles it, wants to find it, first thing they're gonna see is that line of, from Mideast of, of these harps. And there's a cottage industry of harp building in uh, Pakistan. And if you don't get to see the instrument first and you direct them to get a Dusty or to get a Ogden or a Troubadour or a uh, harpsicle, and they haven't seen the instrument first, but it's new, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a decent instrument. Plus, once you, you start sending your school is buying harps from uh, from Dusty or from harpsicle, um, you get to be friends with the people that are supplying your harps, and they don't want to send you a junk of harp. And they also uh, are, tend to be they're really supportive. Uh, of, of school programs. I mean, it's it's a it's a big thing for them. So they'll they'll give you discounts. They'll make sure you're getting a decent instrument. Dusty Strings has been great with us. If we get a harp that buzzes or has a crack in it, or or you know, they sent us regulation kits and tools and coached us through repairs and 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 all that stuff. So um, when COVID came, the the numbers started going down. And then, um, so I sent, I sent the harps home with kids. I let them take them home because we were locked down. We were locked down for a year. And so the only way they were going to play is if they had one, because we weren't at school. Um, at first, I was very cautious about it. But I, I would send a kid home with a harpsicle on the weekends if they wanted to play over the weekends and they're really sincere about it. Um, when we came back uh, from COVID, the numbers were down enough that I had just enough harps that I could keep a set in the classroom and the kids could take, have a harpsicle at home. Um, we also would do a thing that, that uh, occasionally uh, someone would donate a harp. Um, we had uh, someone whose uh, uh, son passed away and he was a brilliant harp player and she gave us the harp. And one kid fell in love with this harp. And so uh, at the senior awards program, I made sure it was okay with administration. We would have, we had the Randy uh, Parker Memorial Harp um, Award and we gave him the harp. And he didn't know it was coming. It, it was just, we just picked him because he, you know, he wouldn't let anyone touch that harp. We played it all the time, called it Big Smokey. And uh, um, there wasn't a dry eye in that auditorium when he got that harp. And he's been out for about five years. And he's playing gigs all over town. And, and it's just really happy. I mean, there's, there's just nothing like harp. And, and the, the kids love it. The, the parents love it. The faculty. Uh, it's just, it, it's good for everybody. And so, you know, there's, you're going to get a lot of support. Oh, back to what you said about having a teaching degree. Um, there are some programs that do have a lateral entry uh, for public school, which means you can start teaching and you work on your certification, or your licensure. You have like two years to get it. So you're in the classroom, but then you're also taking some education classes. Um, there are a lot of folks that have performance degrees and went to college and have a bachelor or a master's degree but haven't done uh, music education. And so usually, you know, schools are gonna be like, mm, I don't know. Um, but if they have a lateral entry program and they, and they need teachers, then um, even if you're not uh, you know, all about being an elementary uh, music teacher, that gets you in the system. And if you can get hired by a school district um, and start teaching and, and you have a heart, then people are gonna be interested in it. So here's another, uh way to get in that this is what I was told so I went to the public school and talked to them and like I said it's a bureaucratic mess you know that you have to go in because they said the same thing to me like with you Mike you know there's it there the kids are limited in the block periods about how many electives they can take and obviously this is an elective course and they may like the idea but they're going to say oh well the district just won't allow it so I went to the private school the private schools are a different matter because they have more each school can choose what how they want to handle their classes. They don't have to get the big district to give the umbrella okay. And um, they, I was told they would love to have me. And let's start like as in the after school. Um, you know, they have all these enrichment classes after school, which is I like better because you get to set your price and you actually can make more money than as a private school teacher. Um, you know, they don't pay very well, but you can supplement your income or you can. You can go after school and they have these programs and they and so I was told let's this is great we'll start you in an after school program each class is eight weeks and then you can 
continue it, you know, if it's successful. And the principal at this particular school said, I know this will be popular. Everybody's going to want to do it. But my question is, okay, they want to sign up for an after school program and it's an eight week program. Where are you going to get a heart for this? Because the schools aren't going to provide for that. And do, do I ask the parents to like, oh, let's try it out for eight weeks. You know, this was, this is a stumbling block for me that I haven't been able to find the answer to in order to start this program, which obviously is a foot in the door. And if it worked and it was great, you know, we could move into the, the real school curriculum or into another school, but I just haven't known like, okay, well, do I ask parents to buy a harp? Any ideas? Oh, go on, Mike. Oh, that's hard. That's a tough one. Because I think that when you do a private school, I did private school for several years before I did public school. And that's really more like running a private studio. They're just providing the space. If you have eight students signed up and they pay X number, they're doing the billing for you. But it's not a lot different than teaching at a church academy or, you know, an after school program or, you know, a cultural arts center that has teaching studios or a music store. It, it, it's more like that. So it's trickier to get the harps. But if you're, um, cause they're, if they only see you once a week for a lesson, that's different than teaching classes. Um, but, uh, you know, grant writing, would, I would think would be the way to go. If you can find, if you can get a class set of harpsicles and um, go to the regional arts council, go to, if there's a community foundation, um, if there are, uh, you know, find out who's given the grants uh, and check with the uh, arts council, the state arts council, and you can write a grant um, usually can get a couple thousand dollars and that can buy you several harpsicles. Cause I would think if you're not, if you're only gonna see them once a week, they're probably gonna need a harp at home to play. And uh, if, if, it's a, um, if it's a private school, um, you know, depending on the demographic, I mean, if they're, if they're pulling up, uh, if their kid is driving their second BMW to school every day, there's a good chance they could afford to go buy a harp. Exactly. Um, you know, but you, you don't want to exclude kids that can't do it if they can't buy one. So the hardest thing, you know, if they, they can buy a guitar for a hundred bucks, but you can't buy a harp for a hundred bucks. So Robin, um, Robin, you look like you want to say something. Oh, well, no, no, no. I like, um, you know, um, Harpsicle definitely check out because they have a really um, generous, I would say, teacher program in terms of getting started. Um, you, there are more people around that we don't know about oftentimes who have harps sitting in the corner and they don't play them anymore. So I would almost start like a local campaign personally to see if anyone had harps to rent. You know, I mean, of course, I want them to just give them to me and um, I, I work on that with the foundation. Um, but even if somebody who isn't using their harp anymore and for a nominal amount would rent it, I, I just really believe that you have to start it yourself. You're gonna to have to start it yourself. So even if you were personally to get two harpsicles and even some of the companies might be willing to give you a rental fee that is, is doable. Now, of course they can't take these homes, but all you need is two kids playing together, showing that it can be done. It's really all you need and that is so completely possible, right? Because you could, all the little harp tricks, the things that you get mad at when you see somebody on TV and they're like going, rrr, 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 and everybody's like, yay. Well, no, that's what you need. You got, that's when you use your little yay moments and you just put them up there, you dress them up. You're going to have to, you know, commit and, and put something of yours or look at your friends. Like I say, my first concert, my friends lent me their harps for me to put them behind these kids to have 10 harps on the stage that literally that night had to get out of there. And just by, by sparking that, my superintendent was, well, well where do we get the harps from? Also, um, um, Dennis Waring, who has the um, harp kits, I love music makers and that's great, but if you need something just even more inexpensive, the hard cardboard harp kits that he does at Somerset all the time, guess what? You now have an idea for a STEM harp program because now they're gonna build it and they're gonna use math and they're gonna use science and they're gonna use all this. So they're gonna build their harps 
and play. And I would do some, if I were starting new right now, I would put those, you know, there's always the buzzwords. I would put that stem word right in there and I'd have a couple of harps that they're gonna build while I still had harp. You know how cooking shows, they're like, this is how we make it. And they say, okay, and this is what it looks like. So I'd have a couple of harps already built while we're working on that, but I would look at that. And um, Mary, I have a handout that that I used to use for, um, and Mike probably does too, um, uh, for public school programs and everything. It is probably outdated. I will send it to you though, and you can send it to everyone just so they have it because really so many of the different steps, um, and like they say, private school is very different from public school, churches, all of these, but yeah, it would be worth it to get a couple of your harps, harps yourself and be like, you know what? Let's go. I'm going to just, you know, with private schools, it is, um, it, I think it might be easier to acquire harps because we had to go through purchasing. You have to buy them from an approved vendor. If you, so we can't just go, if someone is selling a harp on eBay, we can't buy it. Um, but I think with public schools they're you know, like, uh, yeah, you've got to get approved. They have to become approved vendor by the county and some, there's more red tape there. Um, but I love, I, I wanna follow up on what Robin said about get a couple kids that can play and show them off because they, there's nothing more beautiful than seeing kids play hard. And uh, we, I think we did that early on. I called all the local TV stations and on the, on the local evening news, they were like, and here's a, you know, they just, they were so excited and they sent a camera out and they sent, and they did a story about it. And at the end, I made sure to have them say, and you can help too. You know, so we, what I would do is have them come and visit during the day when we're rehearsing and then say, you know, there's a harp fundraiser concert to help children buy harps. You can help by showing up. And if you would like to donate, here's the, and they want to help. And, you know, you just never know who's going to see that on a local evening news. And it, it, it's just always a beautiful thing. Um, the libraries. The libraries, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think it's better. Um, you said you're in North Carolina, uh, Mike, and I know Texas. You guys are, are more open than we are in the Northeast right now. But the libraries, doing a library program and always, always see. I think for a harpist who really wants to create a program, you, you, you can't be that harpist and it's really hard to say this now but i'm going to say it anyway you can't be that person who doesn't want anyone to touch their stuff like forget about it and i know everyone's like oh no COVID. we're now even more afraid but you're not going to catch it that way let them touch the instrument invite them up invite them up look at the person that looks like they have the most money and put them behind a harp you know make it interactive and really really just and and so kim there are, and for everybody, there are more harp programs around this country than you know. I mean, my list, the handout I have had about maybe 25 schools on it, and there are even more now. So there are a lot of people doing this just very quietly. Some are doing one lesson a week. If you have a private student, well, what school do they go to? Well, have them get a friend who might want to learn to just do duets with them. You know what I mean? Like you use all of that to just get in the door because it really... It really works. It's all I teach is harp. It's very narcissistic. <laughs> That's well, and, if, if, and uh, honestly, if you're trying to start from scratch and you're looking to make any money, it's going to take a while. You're going to put in a lot of time on your own because you're, you're trying to educate people on how to get harps, where to get harps, how to do this. I mean, you, you put in a lot of extra time. Because um, you know, when I was doing my class, I, everybody went in, I, I taught an extra hour a day just so that I could teach hard. But one of the real selling points of the program, it was the fact that kids, teenagers would go to school an hour early every single day to play the harp. And if that doesn't sell your program, then you try getting the kid out of bed in the morning, just get to school in the first place. And so here at 7.30, 7.45 in the morning, and I've got a dozen kids sitting up there before the, you know, an hour before anything else is happening and they're up there playing hard. And I know that when they go to their first class, those kids are a joy to teach. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're teaching a math class and the kid has just come from an hour of playing harp, they're probably going to be nice. <laughs> you know? And then the kid's having a bad day, we would put them in the center and everybody plays a circle around and play an air for them. And they could just lay there. And, and we would invite we would invite teachers too. I mean, you know, teaching is very stressful. Hey, come on up and visit the harp lab before school 
and uh, and let the kids play for you. And they would just, I mean, if you play harp, you know, you can play harp. And people who are, especially who aren't used to it, they, it will open up their tear ducts. I mean, it's just such a beautiful thing. And 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 that, that it, the more people you can reach and have them take away, you know, that joy is it's contagious. And Kim, remember, you could do it with one harp. You could have five kids and one harp. You can. And all the other things that you can teach, you know, kids doing the rhythm, da da da. Everybody, okay, take a turn, round robin, take a turn. You're gonna very quickly see who catches on the quickest, and you're gonna start to get your own hierarchy and levels with how you work. But don't wait until you have a stable of harps to do it. I would take one harp and easily work with 10 students. I would bring literacy, do books in playing. So some of them read, I mean, you know, you could do this. Let's yeah, well, that's, that's good to know. Cause I was wondering like, does everybody have to be sitting in front of their own harp? But I wanna make sure I touch on this before we end. Okay, so you get, let's say we you started the harp program. Maybe you have a couple harps, you have a bunch of kids. What is the teaching method? And this was my original, like, all right, what am I going to present? Am I going to, you know, everybody's comments. Some people play piano and guitar. They already know how to read music. Some have never had anything. What do you do? Ladies first. I, I noticed, Mike, you're really jumping in on that. Are you really well, if, if you're public school, I, there I, are standards. You have to teach the standards. And you well, there are, you know, for there are four levels of music instruction that are, that are, that work for every instrument and choral. So you, you shape your curriculum, around, at least on paper, around those standards. So that's that for starters. Right. We do. So, I mean, public school teaching, and that's a good point, Mike. So if you, once you get into teaching in the public school, you have to understand that you're going to have to do um, a lot of bureaucratic work and a lot of bureaucratic thing. That being said, we are still blessed with the realization that no one even the musicians for the most part in the school they really have no idea what we're doing and it's still very interesting to me that they're like oh yay and i'm like they just played two notes but okay let's yay it so when you say method teach what you know teach where you started and i mean literally bottom basement you know go start start down as low as you want you know i try to combine teaching by music, I want my kids, and they have to, per school standards, learn to read music, but I also have them playing without reading music. I have them improvising. I have them, as they love to say, making beats. I have them making things up. But the biggest thing is teaching the position you play. You can't teach somebody else's method if it's not what you do. And then you also have to see where it fits. We want everybody to play. So I had a child with brittle bones, and her hands were like this. And, and But she could play, but you could never hear her. So just because she could play and you never heard her, whoa, that's how we got our first lever electric harp. Because then when you turn that on, you could hear her. You know, there are all sorts of, I mean, I would say to just trust yourself. If you play, teach them what you play. Teach them how you play. Um, if you're saying what books do we use, you know, and all of that, um, I don't know if that's, for this place here, but you know, as as Patricia Terry Ross, who taught at one of the biggest heart programs, Cast Tech, in Detroit, I went to see her when my program started, and everybody had the first heart book on their music stands. And this was right when Harp Olympics and all those books had come out. And I said, Well, what about this? Well, what about this? What about this? She's like, I learned with Betty Perret's first heart book. If it's not broke, that's what I use. That's what she used, and she did, but she made them do everything in the key of C first, and she was like, they couldn't play it, they didn't move on. I like Colorful Adventures by Bonnie Moore because it's got colors in it, and yes, I teach big kids, grades 6 to 12, and they're not mad that the C is red, and that it's CD, and that they can follow along. They are not mad at those colors, and, it, and they progress. There are so, <laughs> so many methods, so I would say, you know, get a couple and just stick. You have to stick with what you know and then the kids will show you some kids are not ever they graduate my program not ever reading music yet this one young man who was the star of the basketball team played take five off of the tape of it was arizona's harp fusion he listened to that tape he didn't realize it were it was a harp ensemble he thought it was one harp and he learned how to play it off of that 
thinking it was one heart because that's where his ear was. Now he's grown and with a child and he's like, my kid's going to learn how to read notes. You know, he's mad he didn't do that part because then all of a sudden now, you know, it's just tiny access. But teach them to me in all ways, but go with what you do. That's going to be your strongest because that's your default. Yes. And it helps to be flexible too. I mean, it, you know, like you said, if, if a kid, if they have decent technique and are not going to damage their hands and their back and their neck and their shoulders, they can do everything. They can do anything. But, you know, some kids, if a kid, like, I would be really mad at you if you made me do the color system because I'm colorblind. And so I see these things with colors and so, you know, you don't teach that to the colorblind kid because I'd be like, no, I'll just learn to see, thank you. I don't need the color because it's not going to help me. If a kid has dyslexia, you're going to have some challenges with, with the note reading and the spatial and the, going to the strings. That doesn't mean they can't do it, but it's not necessarily a one size fits all. You know, um, if, you, uh, <laughs> if you had a dollar for every time you told kids to keep their thumbs up, then, then we, you'd be making all kinds of money. Um, but yeah, and, and I really look at that first. So I like to teach by ear and uh, teach them a few melodies um, and, and just to make sure that their hands and their knuckles and their wrists and, and that they're, you're not going to damage them because that, then they'll always have that. And if you're teaching them a uh, lever harp and they decide to go to a conservatory and do serious studying of, of pedal harp, sure, they're probably going to have to have a year of, of, of technique you know, rigor, but if they can adapt to that because their technique has been fluid enough that they're not playing with a lot of tension, they understand what their hands and their knuckles are doing and how not to damage their wrists, then they can adapt. Um, but yeah, a, 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 a six foot four football player is going to play a lot different than a tiny little girl because it's just, it's different. And, and, you, and that's part of the fun of it. And like Robin said, nobody knows Nobody in the school district, nobody in the, in the, is going to know what you do. They just, they see the results. They see that kids are playing hard, but nobody ever took you know, the amount of, you know, what, what, what book are you using with these kids? You know, we had, we get a couple of class sets of books and we, yeah, we learned by, uh, we use Pamela Bruner's books, the uh, playing heart beautifully. Um, but we learned from books, from videos, by rote, um, Toward the end of my uh, public school career, I started letting them uh, at the very end, if I was playing something and teaching them by ear, like an Irish tune, I would let them uh, film my hands, play the song, but they had to promise not to put it on the internet. Otherwise their mom is gonna be after them because I didn't want any of that. But once we went all remote, everything was recorded anyway and everything just changed so much because of the lockdown. Um, but it has, yeah. you know, to take away, I mean, I have 42 students and um, my classes are mostly 10 students in a class. My biggest class has about 16. And really the reason I make 10 my number is so that on Monday to, that each day, Monday through Friday, I could do two kids, say 15 minutes each privately while the rest are practicing on what they have to practice. And so then they can um, come and get their lessons. So even though I teach in groups, I pull them into the practice room or outside my classroom and I work privately with them that's my goal. It doesn't always work. And it's so it's group teaching with private lessons. Then I put them back in. Also, in my classes, there are kids who don't want to play the harp, will never really play the harp, and they're just kind of there. And so with them, we I just do other things. They learn enough, but you automatically know. And you'd be amazed how much they learn from each other, watching each other. Some of the tarp a top, I was I visited a tar, top harp ensemble in the country, and I said to the girls, "Wow, you are playing that box so great!" And they're like, "Well, we do it all the time. Of course, I can play it. Like that's all we like. <laughs> that's all we. So, so all that repetitive stuff. I mean, you just have to know you're going to have a mixed group. I do give private lessons within that. The kids who really want to play will come extra. So my goal is two lessons a week." 15 minutes each, our classes are 40 minutes, then we get all together and we're playing all together. I have the kids work with each other 
in the group. So, you know, you give assignments. They love challenges. Everything is reality TV. So if they can knock somebody off the heart bench, you know, theoretically, they love that. So making challenges where, okay, group A, B, C, D, let's see who can do this the fastest and the best. You know, they, they really do. So they work well together. And when I need them separately, I pull them apart. I also um, can work in all sorts of chaos. So I can be going around my room working separately with a kid, even while everything is going around. So there is that. I don't know how they can do that. They do that in guitar. I guess you couldn't do it in band, but you'll be in a room with 12 kids and they're sitting next to each other and they're all playing something different and they're tuning each other out. But if you try to separate them, they get upset. They want to be sitting next to somebody that's their friend even if they're not playing together, even if they're not interacting, if you spread them out, they get mad at you. I mean, they just, they like the camaraderie of being, but, but you're right. They, they watch each other and they, uh, and they, they, they push each other. And it's like, well, she can do that. I'm going to, I'm going to practice that. How can she do that so fast? And, and then they, they start wanting to do it by, by hearing, you know, each other. And that's part of the fun of it. And, and you can do units too. Like sometimes we would just do next week, everybody's getting a lesson. So this week, this is what you're going to be practicing while I'm giving the lesson. And uh, or, and sometimes some years I would do like Wednesday is lesson day and everybody's getting five minutes with me, you know, but we had a you know, block schedule and I, I stay on schedule. So have whatever you're playing, whatever questions you have, whatever you need to do. You know, I've got a rolling chair and my harp and I roll up to each kid. What you got? What, okay. Okay. Try this. Now you, maybe you can do this and this and this and this. Very good. All right. I'm moving on. And, you know, I hit that timer. And you can spend a couple minutes with each kid, um, but it's it's really hard because then then you you, you know you want to take it to the next level, but you know the next kid is waiting. So that that's part of the differentiation. And then you also have some natural leaders that um, that they teach, and you know sort of that thing. If you if you can teach something to somebody, three stages: you teach it to them, you watch them do it, and then you watch them teach it to somebody else. They've gone through all of those phases. And so they learn it. You have to learn it different if you're going to teach it to somebody else. It's like, you know, like I know uh, Billy and Grania do that. Whatever whatever they're going to put on their next album, they, uh, they're going to teach it at all their workshops. And then a year later, you're seeing them play it on concert because they they learn from teaching it. And uh, the kids do that too. Absolutely. And if you have perfect pitch, this is not the job for you. I'm just saying, my, my guests, my friends, when they come into my classroom, the first thing they do is pick up a tuning key, and I'm not insulted because I have 26 harps in my classroom, and, and I'm not insulted when they come in and they do this. But, you know, I mean, you just have to, Mike said it best, I think, that flexibility, you need to be doing it or wanting to do it because it's what you love to do especially if you're going to go into the public realm because you still will have hall duty you still will have time restraints you still will have lesson plans you have to write and turn in you will have some of those type of things so there are you know benefits to forming groups that are outside of say uh, an, an official place so that's where your church libraries need programs all the time that's where all those places come into play but i think you all should do it start with three kids <laughs> What I love about the public school, though, is that I just retired this year and I got to check every month for the rest of my life because I was teaching guitar and harp in public school. So, you know, you work really hard for it. and health insurance. So you know, teach now, Mike, is your job up for grabs? Tell these folks. Um, well, they have uh, it's it's a long, unhappy story with uh, because of COVID and budgeting and whatever. Um, they did get a guy, so I was teaching guitar and harp, so they did hire a guy, but he's not a harp player. Um, but, you know, he's got a degree in music, he's a classical guitarist. So uh, they're not gonna hire someone just to teach harp. Um, and he wants to do it, but he's a little overwhelmed in his first year. So what I'm hoping is maybe over the summer, he can take some lessons with me and I can kind of, you know, point him in the right direction. If he's gonna be starting with beginners and he has decent hands, that's the thing, you know, if he's, if he's gonna be a hack and somebody who's not, just not gonna really do, he's gonna do a crash course and not be really qualified to teach it, I'd rather not even have him do it. Um, but if, if he uh, is interested in, and, and I've heard from folks, I'm trying to stay away, he needs to find his own way. I was there for 18 years. So I'm not standing over him. I don't work for the school district anymore. Um, but I have a heart program at an academy near here, which is like an after-school program. 
And, um, and it's great because it's back to the one-on-one -on -one teaching and the parents are there for every lesson. And so, you know, it's nice. I don't know if we're ever really retired if you're a music teacher. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'd like to see that program continue. Um, the lady who uh, really helped get us most of those harps is waiting for something to happen. And she is threatened to go up there and take them and bring them. There's like actually the Salvation Army here in High Point has an after school enrichment program where they're teaching music lessons. And she's thinking of going and grabbing those harps and bringing them up there. Um, if, if they don't start using them. They made, they actually made an agreement when they donated the harps that um, if Connors leaves, um, that these harps do not get mothballed. They stay in high point and, and somebody's gonna play them. We don't want them just sitting and gathering dust. Uh, it's kind of an a, a, you know, extenuating circumstances because of COVID right now, we're just trying to stay afloat. Um, but I think I'm confident that they're gonna be played because you know, there's a room full of harps. They're all still sitting there. You walk in, you're like, wow, what is this? And That's so great. it'll happen. That was great. So um, it's 4.58 and we've had a lot of great questions, a lot of discussion. Is there anyone uh, in our audience who has a question? We just have a couple minutes, but does anyone have a question? Mar Marsha, Marsha, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, it's for Robin. Could you please uh, go over again the part about teaching a group of students with only one harp? I was trying to write it all down. Oh, okay. So that if I was going to be teaching, so you're teaching a group of students with one harp, right? So you can literally, I mean, you know, if you say you're going to teach Farajaka, G, A, B, G, G, A, B, G, right? You get them all singing it. You get them all, you know, clapping the rhythms of it, right? You go through all that. You have them air harp. I know that sounds crazy, but I'd have them air harp. And then one by one, you bring them all up, you know, let them have their chance, let them have their chance. And you're going to see the different variations and you just encourage them. I mean, you just round robin it. You just round robin it. Have some of them looking at rhythms. Have some of them, I mean, if they're really tiny kids, you know, some some can be drawing, some can be doing um, all sorts of other things um, while one person is literally pulling the strings. And you just make it little and you keep building on to it, building on to it. You have a timer if it's a time thing. Um, you have to be really good with time, which I know Mary's like, yep, and it's six o'clock. Oh, it's six o'clock here. Sorry, it's five o'clock there. But I will, I'm going to send Mary, um, if it's okay, Mary, um, yes. I'll send this handout thing, because I think you have everybody's name who registered. And it's just, you'll, you'll see way back when all the things that I did do, or it's just my musings. But yeah, you just, you know, you teach it like it's one person 10 times. And you hey, just- Kim, do you still have that article that I sent you about uh, from the Folk Harp Journal? that you could maybe send to people. I think you're muted, but uh, they, the, the uh, uh, Folk Harp Society had, I did a, a article about 10 years ago called uh, Public uh, uh, Harp. Oh yeah, Public I have School. those things and I have your curriculum too, which was we, I thought, really helpful. Can you send that out to folks? Cause yeah. I think that would be really helpful. I'll send that to you, Mary. Okay, yeah, you can send that to me and I'll, I'll get it to people. It might take me a while because I haven't figured out on Zoom how to, download just the people that have attended one particular Zoom meeting. You know, I, I have to go and, and kind of cross-reference to all the, and if anyone knows how to do that, let me know, but I, I have to cross-reference to other people. Anyway, I, I, I wish I could download all the, all the um, attendees' email addresses, and I don't know how to do that. So if anyone knows, let me know. <laughs> But yeah, th this has been a great conversation. Um, thank you, everybody. And, and in the chat box, I put, uh, I, we've got a website, harpteachersgathering.org, and I made a donate button. It took me about an hour to figure out how to do it. So, <laughs> but I, I'd like to be able to, to donate to the, our presenters. So um, donate, um, if, you, if you can, that would be great. Um, anyone else have any final final words, final blessings before we uh, before we sign off for the day? Nope. Well, Kim, thank you for um, coming up with these questions. Mike and Robin, thank you so much for agreeing to participate, and thank you all of the members that have. Uh, watched this. I think we learned a great deal. I think we could actually almost have another one because I had a whole list of stuff 
that um, I, I wanted to get to that we didn't get to in my experiences in an already existing public school program. So I think that that might be some a topic we could we could talk about at another date. And then feel free to share my email address with anyone. I'd be glad to talk to any of you if you got really want to get specific about some things you're trying to do and you know anything we can do that, to help. It's, um, yeah, and, and what I like about every time we have one of these Zoom conversations is all the presenters, everyone is just so interested in helping out and getting the program going. And, and I think that that's so great. It's, it's, it's a, an altruistic kind of a thing rather than me, 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 and I'm going to make all the money. You know, it's, it's really nice that we are all so supportive of each other. So thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you all. This is really helpful. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to end the meeting for now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.